good morning, everyone. Uh, we are not able to get on to YouTube today for uh, reasons passing understanding. I, in the last two weeks, I've discovered that this is a Zoom problem, and I don't know um, what caused it to resolve, but it did resolve last time. Uh, and uh, that was mysterious also, but now uh, I'm having the problem again, so I'll have to work with that with my friends at Zoom, but not during this session. So we're going to go ahead. Uh, we're on a paragraph 676 of um, Answer to Job, and we're going to talk about how excited Enoch's unconscious got. <laughs> <laughs> that should be good. Okay. All right. So I will read the first paragraph here. Uh, Enoch's unconscious is vastly excited by all this and its contents burst out in a spate of apocalyptic visions. It also causes him to undertake the peregrinatio, the journey to the four quarters of heaven and to the center of the earth so that he draws mon a mandala with his own movements mm. in accordance with the journeys of the alchemistic philosophers and the corresponding fa fantasies of our modern unconscious. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> either of you have a comment on that? I have a couple, but... It just resonates to me that his... his the mind forgets so the body remembers so his his body is being capital in nature it is moving to the mandala as he is experiencing the mandala so there's a a, a oneness there that in that sense yes the excitement i mean that's 100 percent uncut identity which is incredibly intense and right. in a sense prone to overload you know most people <clears throat> or drive them, drive them like a Formula One vehicle, you know, kind of thing. Yes, definitely. It does do that. Uh, Brian, you have a thought. Well, I was just struck that I don't know that I would have constructed a mandala, but as soon as he observed that, it was like... Well, he, yeah, he's... Part of the path. Um, mind you, this is very late in Jung's writing career. Um, let's see. I, I forget what year it was exactly. Um, I think it was 52 originally or something. Uh, I guess it was 58 that it was actually published in English by Bollingen Foundation, but um, it, I think it was uh, completed in about 1952, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So this is already Jung as a uh, rather old man. I shouldn't say that derisively since I'm about the age he was then. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, let's see, he died at 85 and he died nine years later. So he would have been just my age when he was writing this. And he wrote it in 10 days, so it just burst out of him. So, of course, at this point in his career, he had already uh, been studying what the alchemists were about and what the um, mandalas were about for, you know, 40 years, at least 40 years. And so for him, uh, mentioning a mandala is nothing special, and what he had discovered in his psyche was that, you know, the number four was significant. And I thought it was interesting that uh, when we were in um, Helena uh, for our confluence, Tim did a greet the morning ceremony of Native Americans um, every day. And the, um, and he did it once on camera for me. I haven't posted it yet, but it's a Native American ceremony that he was taught by a member of the Sioux tribe. 
and uh, he does he <clears throat> does it as often as he can. And uh, so he took us through this ceremony, and um, it sounds very much like what Enoch is going through. So the fact that this would have come down through Native Americans um, is is quite meaningful um, and meaningful to make that tie, that connection between them. Um, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> and so any, anyway, I will, I will post Tim's greet the morning, um, probably today, so that people can see that. That's a, that's a very, very yeah. interesting video. And, uh, and interestingly, too, there's a separate short video, about a minute and a half, in which uh, Tim is showing us a sun dog or... Um, showing a sun mandala that we could see in Helena uh, that particular morning. And so that too is a very interesting short video. I'll have to get that up today if I can. Um, but in any case, um, the, the issue of activation or excite, excitement is an issue because that too came up in Helena <clears throat> in a... Um, a comment by Ed Gray, who is a psychologist in um, Helena, who uh, was warning us after our play that our play is about reconciliation after a catastrophe, after a catastrophe in the name of uh, the World War II. And uh, he was saying, we, are, are still activated. We're still having the problem, the problem of the, the revolution of um, Donald Trump and the attempted coup d'etat. And, um, you know, that obviously activates lots of people on both sides of the uh, equation, but it's, we're not after it we're through we're not through it we're still activated mm -hmm. by it and so ed's you know, pardon i was going to say what's interesting too is he couldn't even get a secret service uber to get to his own coup you know so the the, the child wasn't allowed to go to the amusement park so to speak the parents yeah. said no you know i mean so I, all that to me it's interesting because the peregrinatio is typically a wandering journey you know Jung would use usually circumnambulation which is then typically more towards spiral and then Enoch is going directly straight to the mandala which is the squaring of the circle you know the alchemical right. mark of the self so to speak because a circle by itself is pure it's 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 not conscious but then once you draw a line you've gotten direction and then the two lines you've got the paternity so the self has then activated it well, work? and of course, the circle, the mandala, I had never heard of the mandala as a square before I started studying Jung. And Jung is very clear that it can be a square or a circle. And um, and then also that the, the circle is squared, meaning it is simply crossed twice. And <laughs> rather than actually being a you know rhomboid kind right. of square. And, and of course... Uh, Brian wouldn't have seen these pictures, so I'll, I'll uh, show him that in nature, well, first of all, I'll go back, um, um, I'll go back 50,000 years um, and uh, show uh, one mandala. This is the oldest known mandala on the planet, and it was done, it's in Kimberley, Australia. And it was it was done uh, fifty thousand years ago, is what they estimate. Um, and so you think that's really amazing because that was fifty thousand years ago. Um, but then, uh, what's even more interesting is this mandala, which they were finding in the Sea of Japan in the nineteen nineties. 
and they were trying to figure out, you know, what the heck is this, right? Where did this come from? <laughs> and um, and here's the answer. Um, and the puffer fish maiden ritual. Yep. So this is the fugu fish <clears throat> or the <throat> puffer fish, and uh, it's the oh. it, in Japanese oh. cu cuisine, it's the one fish that's poisonous to humans and so if the cook doesn't know how to get this poisonous sack out of it um it's uh you, you know it's curtains for you but in any case this is the puffer fish in his mating ritual and what he does is over a five-day period he creates this mandala which is seven feet in diameter and mind you he's five inches in length and uh, one of my biology friends, uh, Ray Yates, told me that this species separated from humans about 200 million years ago. And, and so this mandala was already in the psyche of living beings 200 million years ago. Um, and what he's doing is he's inviting the female fish to uh, bring her eggs and lay them in the middle of the circle and then he fertilizes them and that's that's their mating ritual but it's just an incredible thing well and like your osprey story too when she arrives she inspects the whole thing it's it's a you know he kind of has to move away and she takes over with qc you know yeah is this is this a beautiful place to put my eggs or not? She, or she not, moves yeah. on along. It's like right. So they're still doing it 200 million years later, um, and obviously for probably many millions of years before that as well, uh, before humans split off. But um, that was already in the psyche at that point. We have to say. And I've always thought that's a very f interesting fact. So, um, in well, and the, the 50,000 year old mandala on the ceiling of the cave, too, is, is in the form of the spider web. And that's, that's their mythology. <clears throat> the spider was the mother of the universe. Yeah. So, sure. the web of life there. Right. And so, um, that's a good, good uh, observation. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but coming back to this issue of um, the, uh, the psyche being activated, um, we, you know, we have lots of things in our psyche, like a mandala like that, which probably most people have never even thought about, certainly not consciously, if they get into, you know, the art of uh, mandalas. I know that going back to when I was four or five years old, I was always fascinated by kaleidoscopes and how they would change and so on. And um, uh, I used to stare at them for hours and watch how they, they changed. And yet they're always in that circle, right? And uh, it's just fascinating to, to look at that. And, and so there's something I, I already know, even from that age, that there was something about that that I liked. And, um, you know, I've, I've definitely gotten carried away. I, I had a very good kaleidoscope at one point, but it, um, it, I finally used it so much it was destroyed, so I don't have one at the moment. But uh, my wife to this day calls me her kaleidoscope because she knows that, you know, if we, if I run into some sort of a roadblock so that my uh, progress can't go in a certain direction, I'll just um, change and, and be something else. So when she met me, I was, a, uh, I was an international business executive and and now I'm whatever it is I am that people can describe, which probably they can't. <laughs> and so, but, but the point about the activation is that these things can come down out of the psyche. They have come down 
in the United States in our in our um, bifurcation of our society, and um, and they are activated now, and so we either get control of them, uh, or uh, we're going to have a period of extreme chaos before um, the new world will emerge. And um, and so I don't know if if they if they can be tamped down by normal society, which is what they're trying to do, <laughs> which your guess, I mean, um, or, uh, or whether they have to play through, because my experience with archetypes is that they have to play through, they have to mm -hmm. play their full story out. And, you know, we have the one terrible example of uh, Nazi Germany, where it had to play through until all the crockery was broken. And, you know, all the people that were activated were essentially dead. And then <clears throat> Germany could get on and become uh, Amer one of America's best allies. And uh, the same with Japan, you know, they were activated in a certain way. And, you know, after Hiroshima, then they, only then could they readjust could the you know could the kaleidoscope turn and say okay what are what are you going to be now and it could be argued that the there was not there was incomplete resolution at the american civil war yeah mm -hmm. yeah there was all sorts of pulling back and you know culminating in in the I guess the rescinding of uh, Reconstruction and Jim Crow, that there mm -hmm. was protecting of that complex. And perhaps this is why we're here now. Well, that's well and right. even in 1852, Frederick Douglass, you know, asked to speak, had a scathing speech that said, and, and why I ask you, do you ask me to speak today when you, you pout and banter liberty and justice for all when this con country with slavery would would be unacceptable to savages, you know? I mean, and he was no dummy. I mean, he mm -hmm. psychologically he said, you know, it's much easier to build, you know, strong children than to repair broken men or women, you know, adults. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he knew what was up. And it's interesting, Skip, you talked about death here. Um, Nietzsche comes to mind when he says God is dead. It's like the Chinese four. Four is death. Three is you know life and trinity. And mm -hmm. it, it makes me think that with a quaternity with Jung and then with Nietzsche and the God is dead statement, that Nietzsche wasn't saying God is R.I.P., you know, dead. It was that God is no longer only unconscious anymore. And that it's coming into consciousness is maybe a different uh, distinction of how to take the God is dead statement from Nietzsche. That well, and another way to take it is that God is dead. The God right. of, of, of the Abrahamic religions is dead. Old, and, right. and we have to generate something new. And Jung himself said that he thought it would take 600 years for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and so we're, we're only 120 years into that process, and and uh, the 20th century wasn't very pretty. <laughs> well, and you know, some people's like we've talked about it before that with technology, maybe that 600 years would go faster. But as we see with you and the phone calls and tech support, maybe technology will make it go slower. <laughs> it's like because we. <laughs> we, we don't have enough time to think because we're always on the phone with 1 800 fix my computer. It's right, like, right, right. Turn it off and turn it on. So, yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll move it out to 6,000. Just move the decimal point for young. Yeah. And he didn't know the computer so much, so it's 6,000 years. Yeah. But it's not going to feel classes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I, we've we've talked about this acti activation issue or this excited issue where it's in the human unconscious, but in Enoch's case, it got 
activated, I, I don't know, 700 BC, and Jung recognized it as a professional right. psychiatrist. He recognized it in what came out of Enoch. And of course, Enoch didn't even get into the Bible. Um, Enoch's a, a, one of the books that didn't make it into the Bible. And it's probably because the fathers of the church in 325 AD, when they agreed to the treaty or the Council of Nicaea, they said hey, this guy was too too nuts, right? He was excited. I mean, they they might have recognized that themselves that he was he was nuts, and uh, and you know he wasn't he wasn't crazy. Young recognized that he was just a normal human being who had had <clears throat> some aspect of his unconscious activated, and I think that's a significant point to take out but um and what's the greek philosopher that lived in the um barrel or under the bridge that was always um always you know just dressing down the emperor and and the emperor knew that oh, what's his name it's i can't remember um diogenes no. yeah maybe <clears throat> Yeah, but it was, you know, the emperor would always kind of grin, like, okay, one well, statement, the, checkmate again, I lose, I'll move on. It's like, well, and the, the king always had to keep the jo the jokester, yes. <clears throat> the trickster, in right. his court because the trickster uh, was able to show him his foibles by showing him where, <clears throat> where he was, you know, going too far. And, you know, and, and uh, the issue with Trump is he wouldn't ever have accepted, you know, he was a trickster himself and he wasn't so, going to accept anybody else to be a trickster on him. And so he just, he just writes them out of the equation. And um, he's like the little Lord Fauntleroy and the president left the room. So he hopped on the throne and put on the crown. And, uh, <laughs> right. But, and, and but I, I, I saw you know, a cartoon I, yesterday that had the jester on a guillotine, mm -hmm. you know, and and all of a sudden out of the top window, you hear, stop, stop, stop. The king finally just got the joke. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they're living right on that edge. <laughs> yeah, they are. And uh, actually, this this uh, series called um, The Cook of Castamar ends with exactly that scene. Or right similar seat um and uh so you know i urge you uh, both of you to if you haven't watched this 12 part series it's 12 one hour uh episodes it's uh it's really a, remar a remarkable um psychological study but it's also uh just an amazing fun movie and very interesting um you can learn a lot from it. Um, so anyway, um, Cook of Castamar. Yeah, the Cook of Castamar, um, and Castamar is a is a royal, um, a, a duchy within Spain. Okay, so he's a duke, the Duke of Castamar, and she's the she's the cook in his. Um, in his palace. I don't know if Castamar actually exists, but there must have been something like this back in the day. Um, okay, so um, Jordan, do you want to go on with 677? Certainly. When Yahweh addressed Ezekiel as, he quote, son of man, this was no more, at, no more at first than a dark and enigmatic hint but now it becomes clear the man Enoch is not only the recipient of divine revelation, but is at the same time a participant in the divine drama, as though he were at least one of the sons of God himself. This can only be taken as meaning that, meaning that in the same measure as God sets out to become man, man is immersed in the pleromatic process. He becomes, as it were, baptized in it and is made to participate in the divine paternity. 
in parentheses, i.e., in essence, is crucified with Christ, close parentheses. That is why even today, in the rite of the Benedictio Fontis, the water is divided into a cross by the hand of the priest and then sprinkled to the four quarters. Right. Okay. Um, Brian, any comment on this? Um, no, but it's interesting that, you know, the kind of super imposition of the, <clears throat> the layers and levels that, uh, you know, even Paul talked about being crucified with Christ. Yeah, and, um, and we're ta talking about layers of the psyche here. And so I've had a recent experience with this where um, I, of course, have lived nine lives or not. I, I guess I'm not done with all nine yet, but I, I probably lived seven. <laughs> seven of the <laughs> nine. And... Um, and so as a result, I have a lot of things that are in my pleroma, in my own psyche, in my deep unconscious. And so this uh, spring, uh, I was having this experience of remembering something that happened to me in 1970, so 52 years ago. And, um, and looking at it now quite differently from how I looked at it then. I'm going to do a, a separate one-man show on, on this within the next week, I hope. Um, but basically what it is, is that uh, I, as a as Marine Corps officer, I was going to the, to the regimental commander's briefing every morning. Uh, because I was the, I was one of the interrogation officers and responsible for the prisoner of war camp. And so we, as an intelligence officer, I had to show up every day and brief the colonel on what was going on from an intelligence perspective or what was emerging in our interrogations. And, um, and so every Monday, the chaplain um, would show up at our uh, briefing and he would report that there were 11 or 12 Marines that showed up for chapel yesterday on the Sunday. And, um, and, you know, I guess I took note in my own pleroma about that way back then, but in a conversation that Tim Holmes and Judith Stone and I were having uh, this spring, um, that dropped back out of my pleroma and, and now it's here. And so the question is, uh, that it arises is, uh, the spiritual malaise of society and how we got to this point. Um, and I don't know, would either of you dispute, dispute that there's a spiritual malaise in our society? Yeah, I don't think that the symbols and uh, liturgy are speak to people anymore. No, they don't, obviously. And also, too, the going back to the you know what you said, Brian, with you haven't had resolution in the Civil War. That you know, I get a lot of pushback from people when I say this, but um, the slavery—I hate to say it—was the superficial surface topic. But mm -hmm. follow the money, you're dealing with cotton and sugar. And the South had the cotton and the sugar, and the North had the money, but they wanted the cotton and the sugar too. You know, and it's like mm -hmm. you you play the game of, you know, you have what I want, you won't let me buy it because I'm trying to take your slaves away. Because right. if I do, you're not going to be profitable, but I want it all. I mean, so there's a whole, I hate to say it, but mm -hmm. There's the ones who didn't want slavery were at odds with the profit of the South of the people who had slavery with the products that the ones who had, did not have slavery wanted, you know, and so one is not even possible without the other in that money situation. But as we all know, that's not a static situation. So the, the changes in the dynamics then it's still about the money rather than the people. And even like, you know, what um, Frederick Douglass had said, you know, 
country of savages would look down upon what the U.S. was doing at that time, right. and probably even now. And, yeah. and so, any, anyway, um, in terms of my experience now, I look back on that time, and I'm sure Colonel Judge said, and we were on a combat base with 5,000 Marines, the 5th Marines were there. And so, you know, we were going out from that base on various operations. And um, I'm sure Colonel Judge would have said at the time, well, if the guys don't want to go to church, I'm not going to make them. You know, that's not my job. And, but as I look back on it now, I say, that chaplain was not addressing the spiritual well-being of the <clears throat> regiment. He was a regimental chaplain, and he was going through the motions of his uh, weekly liturgy, but he was, he was not looking at the fact that <clears throat> he was only reaching two or three percent of the men there. And uh, you know, and so, so much for the idea that there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, yes, there are. <laughs> and, and it's reflected in our society today. And, um, you know. And well, and even the, the atheist piece being turned in the foxhole. I mean, the, you know, the, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the disbelief comes from experience of, you know, what have I, what BS have I been believing in, you know, I mean, kind of thing. And then they, they leave and become atheists in that way where, you know, if this is such a loving God, that's not what this is. I mean, so there's almost a logic, a philosophical logic that occurs to drive people to atheism in foxholes. Right. In and addition and to Christ fell in that human, very human moment. Um, Christ fell into that human trap. He he um, he became he became human in that moment. Okay, if he right. if he was divine throughout in that moment, he became human and was be reacting as a human. But because he had lived his life so purely, this is what Jung said. Because he had lived his ministry at least we don't really know what happened for like 18 years of his life but uh between ages 30 and 33 he li lived his ministry so purely that uh he won through to to the um to the divine he you know he he is recognized as uh, the son of god and uh but what, how that's been now um, corrugated and, and messed up is that, uh, you know, the, back in those, in that day, they were talking about all of us being potentially sons of God, but, uh, and sons and daughters of God, children of God, it would, those words are actually in uh, John, in the book of John. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, it's like with Lilith these days and books being burned. I mean, any book worth burning is worth reading. Any woman worth demonizing is worth getting to know better. And in that sense, that's what always interested me about Jesus. You know, any man worth demonizing is probably worth getting to know a little bit more about because he must have touched the nerve way deep inside. For example, what's driving the Civil War in that sense, which goes counter grain to the drivers in the in the equation right and this is this is why uh tim holmes's sculpture is so meaningful to me especially <clears throat> his sculpture called returning the nails because he has uh mary mother of god returning the nails from the crucifixion to the roman authorities and um you know that affected me so deeply when I saw it the first time and it still does and it still has my bell ringing and uh, I don't know where where it will ever end I, I think probably it will never end but the point is that 
uh, whether or not that event um, occurred physically in what we would call the real world. It, it did occur in the Pleroma and it dropped out of the pl Pleroma in Tim Holmes' psyche and he manifested it. And, um, and what <clears throat> is significant about it is that, that Jung was always talking about the spirit not the not the logos not the words the words are just the skeleton on which you create something and you know even as an architect jordan you have to acknowledge that uh, the any building is just the logos but it depends on how you bring it to life that matters it it is and also then the harmonic resonance of how you resolve the structural forces. And so there is that living energy of physics um, mm -hmm. in within the structure. But um, for example, if a building doesn't deflect, it explodes. If there's zero defect deflection, well, the forces aren't resolved, the structure will literally explode. Yeah. So if you don't have that softening, <laughs> that even you know eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch of deflection, that's a living, when it's called basically a dynamic force, you have live loads that are causing harmonic, you know, pumping or mm -hmm. any kind of distribution interference patterns. Yeah. And if, if they get too resonant, for example, when that's why soldiers stop marching in formation across bridges, mm -hmm. because the harmonic will create a big standing wave and literally collapse the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's because the, that kind of order goes counter grain to capital in nature, you know, yeah. the way it's working because nature doesn't need order. It has its own dynamic of, you know, some people call it chaos. I just call it nature, um, mm -hmm. but it's interesting. Yeah, because structurally um, there's a whole lot in that. In fact, I was working on a paper years back just called structural psychology. And it was, you know, stress is not the issue. Stress is simply a force applied, you yeah. know, like this strain. That's the issue permanent deformation. Something mm -hmm. doesn't remember, you know, its previous form. So it's interesting between stress and strain, um, fear being environmental awareness or situational awareness, mm -hmm. but then anxiety hijacks fear and it becomes afraid. There's a problem. So strain, mm -hmm. afraid versus stress and fear that are just forces. So it's, there's a whole lot i'll stop there but there's a whole lot even in, to me in structural engineering that mm -hmm. that dials in to directly align and no pun intended resonate um with well with that's young. a that's a very interesting factoid that you had about uh not marching across bridges it makes perfect sense to me now that you mention it but nobody ever yeah. taught nobody ever taught me that in the marine corps oh, right. <laughs> we did. i mean yeah, we we were we were not allowed to march like across bridges. You were not right. okay. Yeah. And it just come, came from NCOs. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, just don't do it. No. Yeah. Yeah, don't do it. Um, but it makes perfect sense now. And of course, I I have learned that you know you can't have a lot of people on a bridge. So uh, the you know it's uh, what I did learn in in the tank battalion. I was in the 8th Tank Battalion for five years. And what I did learn there is that a woman in high heels puts more stress on a road <laughs> than a tank does because that little circle, which is her rear high heel, is carrying all her weight. Um, and um, Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I used to use a, a hardwood floor urethane covering mm -hmm. called traffic capital t traffic mm -hmm. and what it was the only thing you need to look at is in the msds is that its breaking point was greater than 300 psi because mm -hmm. a 108 pound woman putting all of her weight on a one quarter inch diameter area that's 108 pounds that's you know a point so you you know the first thing you do when you walk into a house to see what you need to do with the floors you walk into the piano room if it has no carpet 
and you'll see the little trail of the woman who has walked up to sing next to the piano and mm -hmm. in, in her heels and it'll just be like this Hansel and Gretel you know ding 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 <clears> you know the dimples and in, in the floor you're like okay well you're you, you got a pine floor it's really soft so you know we, we need to cover this you know, <laughs> some, you know and it's interesting though but yeah that the force distribution of a smaller surface area a quarter inch diameter you know high heel right. it's literally a um a hole punch you know right through and paper it's a it's a little known fact that the interstate highway system was built to support tank warfare it wasn't right. built it wasn't built for cars it was built for tanks so that it could <laughs> support tanks um, and with periodic one mile long straight lines that could be used as landing airfields strips. yeah airfield yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, Brian, do you want to take a hack at this uh, next paragraph, which is 678? Can I make a quick comment? Pardon? Can I make yeah, a sure. Quick Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're kind of talking kind of back to your idea about the, I mean, at any given Sunday, I, there were probably a couple thousand, well, maybe a thousand Marines who are off duty, not sleeping, who could have gone to chapel. Uh -huh. um, and something that th this is a book I I read. Uh, Saving that, Paradise. That kind, yeah, and it's written by uh, two uh, UU ministers, but there's one's a scholar. And the point was is that, and I had noticed this ages ago, probably forty years ago. I was looking through <clears throat> art in the catacombs, and you can't find the crucified depiction of Christ. Hmm. And in fact, you can't find a, a, any sort of sacred depiction of Christ being crucified until around like 900 to 1000 AD. Mm -hmm. They were, they first came out of uh, uh, Saxons who were being uh, by the local king oppressed into Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and was it? Um, uh, Constantine also noted that the so the emperor was living residing in Milan when he was there, and the bishop of Milan uh, excommunicated the emperor because his troops had committed atrocities, and and Constantine observed that that was one of the things that sort of made him start thinking seriously about Christianity, but in even the development of the canon, that was done after the co-opting of Christianity into the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the canon probably has something to do with, you know, what, what's compatible with empire. And anyway, at a long, around the time of Charlemagne, you know, Abelard came along and came up with just war. And that's, that, that was a whole process of getting Christianity out of this pacifist, uh, you know, state into this, uh, you know, tool that could give you crusade. But it's just interesting because for a thousand years, Christianity was not anything like we would recognize. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was a pacifist sort of earthbound paradise. Christ is depicted as either a shepherd or, you know, a happy king, uh, you know, in the world. Yeah. And so to me, there's a process of bottling lightning that goes mm -hmm. on. And I think that that's almost what, what the problem is. It's taking away, you know, personal, even gnosis or spiritual experience and packaging it for societal use. And I think that that stops speaking to people because it also ossifies it. Mm -hmm. It does ossify it. I mean, that, that, and that making brittle, um, making bone of it, then it, then we get the, you know, you call someone sheeple or a sheep, but in modern times, as if that's a bad thing. You know? What's the name of the book, Brian? That Saving that Paradise, How Christianity Traded Love of This World for Crucifixion and Empire. And is that picture on the front, the great eye in Finland? No, this or, is, uh, I think this is probably great in Great Sophia. No, this is probably Ravenna. So that's Christ, Ravenna. the shepherd, 
Oh, mm -hmm. now I see. Okay. And he's like, uh, you know, happy guy. Oh, so there's heaven. And there's the world. Hmm. And it's Life interesting in the world heaven... and not this way off, you know, always dying, <laughs> you know. Well, heaven anyway. is the void there. What's interesting, heaven is the void. Heaven is the unconscious. Heaven is the creative wellspring there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hmm. the, the cross is up there as a mandala. Yeah. But it's not it's not got Jesus on it. Right. And this is like 500 AD kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, well, if you've seen the how, cartoon. How did, how, did that, uh, how did that get done? That's the first time I've seen an image of Ravana. And I, th I had heard, and there's this apocryphal union story that he had gone to Ravana and he had seen the mosaics and how beautiful they were and yet at that time they were destroyed they weren't there hmm. uh, well maybe they're plastered over you know some bishop comes in and goes like get rid of that stuff it's distracting me plaster it over yeah <laughs> right yeah that could be that could oh, be who knows. yeah uh, it's just but i think that that speaks to what you're saying is like the this taking sort of like managing the god complex yeah right the point of being you know castrated and impotent and <clears throat> or so, you know so so critical. so it is lightning in the bottle that's a very that's a very good way to except when it. you open the bottle there's no lightning in it right right because it's yeah it's long gone i mean it's yeah. it's like in a sense they put a cork in the creative wellspring you know they put a cork in heaven you know and it's like right yeah well, there was a cartoon recently I saw with it's like two aliens land in a UFO, right? But they land right in front of this crucifixion statue. And one goes, what do we do? I'll tell you what to do. We get the out of here right now. <laughs> <laughs> if they're going to do that to their own, whoa. Yeah. My God. Yeah. What are they going to do to us? Right. Yeah. Well, okay. so so anyway, we will we'll have to see whether whether the uh, lightning in a bottle system works for uh, for what we call America um, and for the, you know, for what we call the Constitution, because uh, if these forces can't be contained, uh, they're going to explode. And this is what, what Ed Gray's point was, that we're just at the beginning of that and well and even the structural thing about deflection comes back to mind of even in so much mm. the containment they have to flex they have to deflect there has to be dignity and difference between both and right, otherwise right, right. that's when they explode when you know when the the impasse is when there's zero deflection between right. two opposing forces but when they deflect if you can again kind of get the soldiers to actually march over the bridge you know you're little by little you're pushing the standing wave the pendulum and it's like a kid with a tether ball faster and faster and that's really how the that works it's just you know first it's just doing this number and then you push it and then all the little push it and then it gets you know it's a trampoline you can't jump well, it does meters, suggest after a while you could get way up there it does suggest that we would be wise not to prosecute Trump, um, at least not not prosecute him at the at the um, well, federal level. Maybe Georgia you know, could get away with it and we could survive it, but at the federal level, it it activates you know all kinds of stuff. And um, well, what are your thoughts, Skip? Then about if not prosecuted, it becomes strategy. From a legal precedent later well that's that's Thanks. obviously oh. what happened with with nixon and that that's uh that's an issue um right. but i mean i can't say that gerald ford was not right by pardoning him he he realized that the nation had to get on with it and um and so you know obviously if we if we don't prosecute him now you know he's going to end up you know very good chance he could end up being president again in 2024 and this time turn turn the u.s into an authoritarian state which he would 
be happy to do because he has you know no looking back he doesn't have that long left to go so why not well, um, at least we'll know where to go look for the ketchup <laughs> on the wall on the wall thing is, is you can't manage this cultural complex i mean i really believe like there there either way <clears throat> the course of action of prosecute or not is not going to stop anything right? yeah I, su I suppose that's true it's it's just whether it's a short wave or a long wave <laughs> right right but i think that so the question is it's almost like in a i don't know alcoholic family you know walking around on eggshells and acting like dad doesn't get drunk every night and pass out you yeah. know face first in the spaghetti <laughs> is you know there, there's a cost to that lack of integrity yes and so i just i just kind of I'm just so I guess what I'm saying is I don't think guess what we're saying. There will be blood. There will be blood, surely. But yep. the question is, is how does the how does the in choose your own adventure, how what is the energy of the path? Right. Right. I don't think you're gonna <clears throat> escape cataclysm by not prosecuting Trump. Right. That, that I think is a fool's errand. Prosecuting Trump will probably result in problems, but there will be a different stance. But not they make, prosecuting they him also cre creates problems. Yes, absolutely. But I'm saying that the, but the stance, the energy, and the stance and the dynamic, and and what constellates is a different cultural complex. Right. Yeah. And of course. Well, I, I was always critical about why Jung didn't step up more in the late 30s. I mean, obviously, in our play, uh, we addressed um, his errors in judgment in the early 30s, but I, I've always been irritated at him for not being more vociferous in the late 30s to try to stop it and the point that you're making and that is made is that he knew he couldn't stop it right and what, I, it, what is that, yeah what is i think that's functioning yeah i think that's functioning and brian i think what you're talking about is functioning and i also think two other pieces that are poured into that his name has not been killed so therefore if prosecuted, he becomes a martyr, which actually increases his power. So there's an amplification rather than a than than a removal. And also, I think there's a kind of a nascent a, a sleep carryover from just a military defensible position of, oh no, if we prosecute one of our, our leaders, that means we're weak. Mm -hmm. We were stupid to elect, and therefore we make an opening for someone to invade mm -hmm. in a way. So whether it's true or not, I think there are all these things functioning, but I think you're right though. You know, I love the choose your adventure. It's like, yeah. that's a perfect way to put it. And I, and I think the levity is important because cataclysm is, it's coming somewhere, but um, more yeah. so than, oh, well, the world's always going to end. It's always going to end tomorrow because tomorrow never comes. But here we, we have this verge point, you know, milestone in the moment that's coming together as if, the watch pot never boils. Well, we haven't been watching for a long time and it's starting to boil. Yeah. Right. What were you going to say, Brian? Well, I was going to say that one other risk in all this calculation is, you know, the, the people who sit in juries tend to be people who don't work because they're retired. And I'm, I'm just going to say it takes one person to pr produce a hung jury. And I think that that's part of the calculus too. Yeah, sure. Because yeah. if you try him and there's a hung jury and he's not convicted that also has a yeah. different position to the cultural complex right so i i don't think there's a way to win this right right um i i i guess i'm reminded of you know jung in the red book this idea of you know basically there will be blood like we there the sacrifice is going to happen to play out a complex or a mm. destiny. Right. Um, 
and that there's kind of no stopping it. Mm-hmm. And that the and sacrifice it, until we learn yeah. something happens. Right. And like January 6th was well, the scrimmage. Or we gain maturity <laughs> as a right, species. Right, the insight or the consciousness or... Right. But I, well, I and what's the old the old quote of uh, you know experience is born of is born of bad decision making, <laughs> and bad decision making is you know gives you experience. I mean, so yeah, there's really no perfect way. You're right. I mean, just even the idea of a hung jury. I mean, that's and even something is is horribly administratively uh, redundant as a jury of an insurance company suing another insurance company. Well, you get a whole dynamic in the, you know, in the jury room because people start going, oh, they keep suing each other to keep getting their money. You know, so there's this whole awareness that happens in that room that you have to kind of manage that, you know, as a jury foreman before you can even get to, well, at the end, they don't want to vote for any of them. (laughs) They want to hang them all. Mm -hmm. But that's not, that's, that's not the plaintiff defendant, you know, defendant relationship. So you're right. comes into that dynamic at the end of just takes one just one out of 12 and wow you know that that's how do you how do you pick a jury that hasn't already made up their mind mm-hmm. <laughs> right without right without being obvious that yeah. you're doing it right so let me just sum up my point about the spiritual malaise which mm-hmm. is that in 1970 i didn't recognize it at all you know i as i said Colonel Judge probably thought, well, if the guys don't want to go to church, no, I'm not going to make them. And he probably gave that chaplain a uh, an excellent foot fitness report, which would be which <laughs> would be customary, right? But he's up ten percent if he you know goes from nine to ten or right. You know, but 10 today, to today, I look back on that and I say, man, you weren't addressing. 97 percent of the regiment in terms of their spiritual malaise and i have a whole thing about what what i was experiencing as spiritual that wasn't involved in christianity at all and what was not uh i was not experiencing as uh spiritual and how my spirit was crushed by certain events had it having nothing to do with battle or Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and so today I'd have to say that he was a miserable failure, this chaplain. Mm-hmm. And what we need to do now, it seems to me, is that we need to start realizing that and and seeing how spiritual how what can be spiritual and you know the conclusion i came to was that not only Jungian psychology is on to that with the idea of opening up the unconscious so you can have healing from it but also religions and all the arts do the same thing if you're actually participating in them not if you're a um uh, not if you're an audience you have to be actually participating because there's there's a there's a duality between recreation and vegetation okay Mm -hmm. sometimes we need some time off to suck our thumb right to let our mind catch up with what what's going on and uh, for example the confluence in helena was an extremely um intense four days and and uh you know tim and i have been talking about a a uh, confluence hangover kind of thing because uh because there were there was so much going on and we were you know our our psyche was you know sort of pouring into all those different things in different ways and so just to let the dust settle or the you know the sediment settle <laughs> in our psyche for a period of time is absolutely necessary no question and we come out of it being different people than we than we went into it we're different 
Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's really resonant to me, Brian's comment earlier about, you know, the liturgy and let me plug this in, I'm about to lose the other laptop look on it. Um, Brian's comment about, you know, basically church, church is not resonating with people anymore. And what's interesting is you see that instead of, you know, you said, Skip, you know, they're losing seven for every one that comes in um, kind of thing. But to put the Christianity back in the church, you know, put the Christianity back in the, in, in the right. bottle. Yeah. And the thing is, when you get someone taking a knee or not taking a knee or preaching on the football field, that's not Christianity. That's marketing. You know, and yeah, and uh, yes, and it, it's too late for Christianity. That's right. passe now. That that it's correct yeah. to say it's you know it's yeah hatching. that that container has been broken in right. all in all forms of Christianity, and so yes, in in Helena about fifty percent. You know, I was trying to connect with some of the pastors around Helena to get some of them to. Uh, come to the confluence. Not a one did, by the way, um, except for Tim's own pastor and some people in his church. But besides those folks uh, and besides uh, Judith Stone, who was at the confluence with us as a participant, um, they're not, not a single local pastor came and so, but in the process of trying to get them to come, I was looking for the various churches around and trying to find email addresses and that sort of thing. And what I found out was that about half the churches are uh, fundamentalist and the pastors actually hide themselves. You can't find, it, find out who the pastor is on their website. Mm -hmm. Or if you find out, you can't find an email address for them. And you know, mostly they they have a shtick that is you know sort of Christianity light, but they're they're getting people in with concerts and that sort of stuff. You know, it's a rock concert. It's not a it's not a um, you know they're using religious music and stuff, but it's no longer uh christianity that would be recognized in the 17th century at all and it appears to me as i did that research that about half the pastors are not ordained uh, mm -hmm. and they hide that fact um, well and they're playing to the in a sense i hate the, the phrase adhd because i mean to me i, I won't go into that but they're the the lack of attention span that's been bred throughout the culture, you know, the quick fixes have shallow roots, but oh, they, people don't care about the roots. They can't see the roots. They don't want to care about anything that's mysterious. That's just to them elusive. And a trickster is a liar mm -hmm. instead of a different perspective and, you know, a birther of different perspectives. And so with the music, I mean, music is one of the, music is to me the purest, most transcendent form of divination. Words never require. You are moved or are, you are not. I mean, chords versus discordant, et cetera, et cetera. But it is what it is. And it, it gets in, you know, unless you, you know, cover up and isolate out. But there, Nicole, as Colleen says, there's no rootless flower. Mm -hmm. Well, that flower is the religion and the spirituality piece, the bloom, the brightness. But there's all the leaves and the stems and the roots that are the ritual that, are leading up to the glory or the splendor as it were and they don't want to deal with all that hassle that's like going to two a days for football in the summer you know and before the season starts you say wow this is uh-huh i mean so, <laughs> you know and yeah. they they don't well, want to play the discipline of the ritual because mind that's, you, I, I understand <laughs> i understand the beef of the Trump supporters, okay, those people that were attacking the Capitol, I understand exactly where they're coming from and why. Uh, and they're, they're feeling out of control. And what they see in Trump is kind of a bad boy who's, who's sort of controlling the people that had them 
feel that they're out of control, right? So uh, it, the way I said it back before Trump was elected back in uh, 2016, I said, well, it's like um, guys that were sent to the principal's office in school. They take the punishment, but they always resent it. And if they, if they can find a way to get revenge over that principal at some point, they'll do it, you know. And, and so a lot of those people have been let out. They feel, you know, left out. They feel um, powerless. And uh, they see Trump as, as a guy that can give them some power back. Um, and then the salt of the earth, you know, losing their jobs to everything going overseas. Yep, exactly. So, that. You know, yep. those damn foreigners, it's really more of a you took my job. Yep, that's exactly me. right. That's exactly and right. And so. yeah. So anyway, um, let us go on in terms of activation and understanding. <laughs> yeah. I think that's true. Though. This particular, <clears throat> we've kicked this particular horse enough. It's been I dead. think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Although I should tell you that I have, have a running poll on this website um, and consistently um, there is a demand for uh, discussions of current affairs in connection with Jung's, uh, with Jung's mm -hmm. work, cool. right? Consistently. It's about 48% for that and the next highest is like, you know, 12%. <laughs> you know? Well, what I like about that is I think when we're all three here going through this, I think it helps not only people out there, I personally find it helps unpack Jung's messaging even further. And oh, surely it does. You know, because yep. it goes from the philosophical to the implementation, you know, from the psychological to the application. I mean, it, it plays across. And I think that's important because then it's 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 not so abstract it can still be poetic but i think it becomes useful and yes. this is this is tools in the toolbox and especially with this right now it's so apropos with you know modern times yeah yeah um okay okay uh, <clears throat> so yeah go ahead brian go for it uh enoch is so much under the influence of the divine drama so gripped by it that one could almost suppose he had a quite special understanding of the coming incarnation. The son of man who is with the head or ancient of days looks like an angel that is like one of the sons of God. He hath righteousness, with him dwelleth righteousness. The Lord of spirits had chosen him. His his lot hath the preeminence before the Lord of spirits in uprightness. It is probably no accident that so much stress is laid on righteousness, for it is the one quality that Yahweh lacks, a fact that could hardly have remained hidden from such a man as the author of the Book of Enoch. Under the reign of the Son of Man, quote, the prayer of the righteous has been heard, and the blood of the righteous avenged before the Lord of Spirits. Close quotes. Enoch says, or Enoch sees, quote, fountain of righteousness that was inexhaustible, close quotes. The son of man, this is a long quote, shall be a staff to the righteous. For this reason hath he been chosen and hidden before him, before the creation of the world and forevermore. And the wisdom of the Lord of Spirits hath revealed him, for he hath preserved the lot of the righteous, for wisdom is poured out like water. He is mighty in all the secrets of righteousness, and unrighteousness shall disappear as a shadow. In him dwells the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit which gives insight, and the spirit of understanding and of might close quote. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's stop there for a minute. I, I just want to point out to everyone that 
in the play that we just performed, which is in a prominent place on this YouTube channel now, um, in the very beginning, uh, the character woman, who's actually, at that point, she's Jung's anima, um, is trying to persuade Jung at the very beginning, in the, in the first three speeches of Jung, to uh, go see Rabbi Beck. Uh, and the argument that she's making, which is an argument that's going on in Jung's unconscious, of course, because it's the anima speaking, um, is that he is, that he might be a sadic, a righteous man. Okay, that's, that's like her third speech in the whole play. And, um, at, and then what you see through the, through the play is that he's, Beck is at first, you know, just activated because of what has happened to him and what happened to him in Theresienstadt. But um, he gradually comes around and acknowledges that, well, he made some mistakes too. And and they weren't uh, necessarily good ones. For example, uh, Han Hannah Arendt in her uh, book about the Holocaust um, talks about Beck and says that he made the mistake of, um, of allowing Jewish orderlies to help the Nazis get the people into the transport. He thought it would be Beck thought that it would be better if they would do it because they're, um, they would be gent kinder and gentler. But what Arendt says, and would, which Beck in fact was criticized for, is that the Jewish orderlies were worse than the Nazis, because, mm -hmm. probably because they were trying to buy, mm -hmm. um, buy some sort Bible. of, uh, yeah. you know, future for themselves with the Nazis. Of course, the Nazis didn't give two hoots, but they were glad to have the help. Uh, and, um, but Beck was, was criticized for that. And that it comes up in the play, he makes the, the positive point that he, he thought of, if they did it, it would be easier. Um, and, and, you know, more gentle and kind, sort of a compassionate way of making people get on these trains that were going to Auschwitz. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's inter and interesting too, I think in the context of the slave trade, because the African tribes would align with the slave masters and mm -hmm. they yeah. would take their enemy and instead of conquering them, they would capture them and basically deport them. <laughs> it's like, so, yeah. you know, they would remove their problem to then increase their lands and, and then get more and more. And so what's interesting is, again, the capitalistic, even in the tribal societies, they were still doing the same thing. Yeah. Exactly the same. You know? And that's, that's, to me, there's a human nature piece there that's, that's really messy and dirty that I think a lot of people don't address of how that gets tempered and yeah. how that gets evolved yeah. and it doesn't get evolved by you know all big golden flower it gets involved by the discipline of the ritual i mean i think you both are mili former military you know i mean i'm former martial arts for decades and there's a discipline of the ritual i mean that's you know you train enough so the mind forgets and the body remembers that's tempering like steel mm -hmm. you know that's that's playing a game with the body that you can walk through fire and actually like, oh, it's warm. You know, it's like, that's it. You know, it's like, you know, right. I'll, I'll be different tomorrow. Well, so historically, Beck uh, was a righteous man. And mm -hmm. now there's uh, <laughs> there are Beck Institutes, Leo Beck Institutes in New York, London, and Jerusalem. And there's even a Leo Beck medal. Uh, that uh, is awarded every every year to s someone who deserves it. Um, 
it's interesting when you're talking about him as the righteous man and then in brian the cover of that book of saving paradise that void that unconscious that black that you know shadow center that nucleus that's that place of the righteous under the throne and it's interesting because that's the dark place and the righteous of course it's heaven because you're protected under the throne in a way but it feels like that dark spot i mean the, the throne under the throne would be in shadow would be the dark circle it feels there oh boy did young ever know that right yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wonder was there any thought that he was uh a part of the sadikim nisarim which are the 36 sadik that have to exist to keep the world in existence mm -hmm. you know about that tradition I, I don't know. It's like throughout the world, the world is evil, the world is terrible, the world is mediocre. Mm -hmm. But as long as there are 36 of these righteous ones, uh -huh. that's enough. I don't know that existence. tradition. I don't know that tradition, but it. it I wonder if that's what they're referring to. Yeah, the, probably. The, this word sadek is right. you know, a righteous one. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting that it came out of the mouth. I don't know of a Jewish woman or just using that term is kind of loaded. Well, it is loaded. And of course, both the authors are uh, Jewish. Um, and, and so it is loaded in that sense too. But later on, um, they talk about um, the tradition of Tikkun Olam, uh, which is uh, rebuilding the world, of returning to the path that um and i guess the story is that in in ancient times before the world um god slipped slipped on something going mm -hmm. down the stairs and right. and, and, <laughs> and the light something. the light yeah. yeah the light broke apart and it went into a million pieces and so there there are sources of light everywhere mm -hmm. and the question is that you know, you have to find that source of light within yourself, which obviously is, you know, let's say up till today, the United States is sort of the result of a lot of clashes and a lot of blood, but it, you know, is, it, it's, the, it's the one country in the world that we have people wanting to come to from every country in the world. Mm -hmm. okay. The one country in the world that has, has received immigrants from every country in the world. And we have a waiting list from every country in the world. Mm -hmm. And so at least the US has gathered these shards of light. Um, but obviously also lots of dark and and uh young wasn't sure whether the light or the dark would predominate but i but i feel pretty sure that the the light will predominate i you know i don't know whether it's going to be things are going to be resolved in three years 30 years or 300 years but the the process that the country as a whole has been going through while very messy is the process that all countries need to go through mm -hmm. in order to find those shards of light. Well, we're also in the orb of, you know, the Pluto and Uranus orbits. I mean, you take Pluto 247 years ish, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, 250. I mean, it's, I call it the empire cycle because if you look back and track through history, through inception to demise of any empire, it goes in 250 year plus minus segments, 240 to 272, I think is the average I've gone, taken it back about 5,000 years. And what's interesting is at 250 in that mid range, the empire must in a sense, go Joe, die and resurrect Phoenix from the ashes, at least to have the reflection to recalibrate, retune what's true north, fix the compass, get the, you know, stuff, the little particles, you know, stopping the arrow from actually moving out of the water. And I mean, so there's a, 
a whole piece every 250 years that we're the U.S. is right in its Pluto cycle, its Pluto return. So we're dealing with that empire cycle, which is not just you know unique to us. It's happened in almost every country that had any kind of dynastic scale to it over you know more than decades, where we're talking two more and a half millennia. Centuries. Yeah, it's one quarter of a millennia right. and two and a half centuries. So what's interesting is then that's not lost because two and a half centuries is ten percent of the wobble of the earth every 25,000 years of the act. So you get all these proportionate things happening. We happen to be right at kind of high noon in the, in the old West and the six guns are loaded, you know, and. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's let's also try. about 10 generations, eight, nine, 10 generations. There you go. Of humans. Um, one thing I say is like <clears throat> Rabbi Beck, though still a Sadiq, made the mistake of managing the evil. Yes. Just like we were talking about earlier. Right. He remains a Sadek. It doesn't mean you can make a mistake, but it's just interesting that <clears throat> his choice to go along with the capo mm -hmm. you know, functionary uh, ruse was actually created more, uh, more evil, more damage, more trauma than the intention. Because mm -hmm. they all inject themselves with resentment. I mean, they, they, they pull that in from right. you're right that's interesting because the managing of the evil actually exposes more people you're trying to protect um with that evil and in a sense i hate to put it this way but shit spatters you know i mean kind of thing where if they get near the orderlies for example you know what are their motivations and that's yeah and, and you wonder about how people might be um sort of set in their ways because i'll just tell you a little story out of school here um i actually was a college classmate and fraternity brother of a man who, who became leo beck's successor about 60 years later okay uh, because leo beck became the chairman of the world union of progressive jews when that began and my classmate was the president of it um, in in the early 2010s i guess is when he was president and um so after we did this play i i wrote to my friend and i i said um oh and also um my friend had has made for years a pilgrimage to germany every year to preach in in uh Christian pulpits to talk about, I don't know, I don't actually know what he talks about, but the Leo Beck medal, which you can find on Wikipedia is about, um, you know, helping reconstitute German Jewry. Okay, and mm -hmm. which is exactly right up, up the line of my classmate. And so I wrote to him, um, and offered to, um, to nominate him for the Leo Beck Medal, and he has not responded. Now I don't know if that's a matter of his health or whether he's responding for not responding for some other reason. But uh, it could be either. But um, I'd never thought about. I mean, the World Organization of Progressive Jews. I'd never thought about the acronym. World Union and of Progressive Flanders. Jews. Yeah, right. But the, the way it's flipped, you you it makes me kind of want to go back with the slang and the slander that people use. Does it often come from some kind of actual official thing that they're just shortening and then bastardizing? I mean Yeah, well they, that's an organization that now uh, it includes about 1.4 million Jews today. Okay, out of the entire uh, Jewish diaspora, and um, you know, obviously, it's it is apart from uh, more fundamentalist Jews, of course. Um, I don't know, uh, Brian. Are you are are you by birth a, a Jew or? No, I've dabbled. Uh, I I thought twice dabbled. about uh, becoming a Reconstructionist. 
But uh-huh. it's, uh, yeah, it's not a solo process, Judaism. I see. Um, well, so, so anyway, I, I, if I understand it correctly, it's a, it's something like five to 10% of all Jews in the world are in this part of Judaism. Uh-huh. And, um, and that, does, you know, none of that comes through in, in the play um, because, I mean, you can only do so much in an hour, right? But we got very deeply into Leo Beck's um, history because of, um, uh, because he was, you know, he he's, has the biggest role in the play mainly and we wanted to understand who he was and so on mm-hmm. and my <laughs> my friend John Jackson who played the part uh, to his great credit uh, had found a portrait of Leo Beck and he put it in the front seat <laughs> of the theater when we were doing our our rehearsals mm-hmm. and we did three rehearsals in Helena before we actually did the performance and you know he put a portrait of Beck in the in the front seat of the theater just to remind us it's very moving I mean the whole the whole thing I've been I was moved by this play from the start and obviously I've now performed it or rehearsed it more than a hundred times <clears throat> so I'm very familiar with it and you, you don't necessarily get all this if you only watch it once but mm-hmm. And also, if you don't, if you're not familiar with Beck's history mm-hmm. and biography, but anyway, um, anybody. Well, I think it? out of all that, I mean, I that's a real gem. I think Brian of that he managed evil. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, that, that's a that's, that's a good way to put it. That's, that's an interesting an attempt. Yeah, that, yeah, it's an attempt. But I, what's interesting is there. So I think it's juxtaposed about this whole thing. Like, what do you do in the face of evil? I think there's the attempt to manage evil, like you're going to somehow outsmart a cultural complex, right? Versus, the you know the the righteous Gentiles were the ones who, in their place in their life, opposed evil, right? And took action and saved lives, as right. opposed to sort of like trying to aikido evil. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. That 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 maybe there's a difference in response or yeah, different that, that is an issue that comes up in the play because um you know back at one point early on i think it's in the third or fourth scene probably the third scene um says that um when the nazis he had become the president of the neighborhood in germany and um which is the Jewish fraternal organization and um, and the Nazis came to him to sign over the property of B'nai B'rith to the Nazis and he refused so he says but I refused and then Jung's response to that is uh, well I too should have refused but I was presented by terrible choices and uh, Beck in the play doesn't accept that at all. Um, because well, the, Brian, the, that, you know, the Aikido engagement piece there, it's always go deeper, always go deeper. Because the closer you get, the more accurate they have to be, but they're already in right. motion. So they've overshot before they, you know, it's, that's the thing is you cannot get struck if you go in. I mean, except for someone who's fast and understands how to, you know, quote unquote, roll with the punches, so to speak. But that going in is also managing the evil. I mean, you're you're becoming the universe by getting one with the attacker. And that's mm-hmm. that's an interesting point with the Aikido, because then the flow, you basically you're diving in the evil pool, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I mean, to, to then yeah, toss you're it. Taking, you're taking the energy of the evil and turning right into something else yeah it's like you're coming at me then i'm gonna turn and then speed you up oh you want to slam into that i'll help you go faster you know it's like you know i'll help you faster into the wall but the thing is that moment you're right leo beck was caught in the in that moment you're managing evil you are touching 
or you are moving through. And now before and after, not so much, yeah. but that moment's and, so poignant. And, well, and then you I, I love the, the difference. I, I love the symbolism of Aikido with the branch and the raspberry on the branch. Um, because my wife and I have a tradition of uh, dessert first, um, <laughs> which we, we, we bought a, a very powerful speedboat at one point, and we enjoyed it quite a lot for uh, 10 years and then uh, gave it to our son and daughter-in-law. But, um, but we're really glad that we took had that opportunity and took that dessert because we could not do it today and uh it would just crush us physically and um and so that branch represents uh you know the guy's got a tiger in a cliff over him and he's trying to get down a cliff to get away from the tiger and he realizes there's a bear at the bottom of the cliff and halfway down there's a vine and he realizes the vine's coming out of the cliff and it's going to it's going to disconnect and he's going to fall down but he sees a raspberry on the branch and reaches out and eats it which is you know you got to you got to take the good things um, where they are when, when they're there mm-hmm. and that's the old the nordic the viking always die with a joke on your breath because then you won i mean <laughs> but then you know you want to talk about getting the last word and they're like well shit he's dead i can't do anything <laughs> it's like you know the person who laughs at the peril so that raspberry is such a great yeah. story of cultures okay so let's go one little bit further here um uh so 679 under the reign of the son of man shall the earth also give back that which has been entrusted to it and she also shall give back that which it has received and hell shall give back that which it owes the elect one shall in those days sit in on my throne and this and his mouth shall pour forth all the secrets of wisdom and counsel um you want to speak to that i have some thoughts about it Mm. well there's your lightning in a bottle you know pouring forth except what's in it anything i mean well i I mean I, i think that the 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 Jews who put together the Old Testament um, were very, very prescient because they did not really know what the universe was about. And they realize, as uh, Edward Edinger said much later, that the universe is in balance. And, um, you know, if something gets out of whack one way, it gets back and whack the other way and um and so somehow they knew that eventually uh the world would end and you know and they're almost speaking to that and what come what does come up in our play is a biblical passage um which is also related to psychology where Jung, first of all, refers it to psychology, and he says, um, when, the, when the shade of self-deception falls away in analysis, um, you see yourself as you are seen and, and as you are in that moment. Uh, and I guess basically one of the big things that Jungian analysts do is, is uh, teach people how they're kidding themselves right and and um, then he goes on to a biblical passage um, which is um, uh, you know in the day of judgment you will see as you are seen and that is a shattering experience so the the point is to know thyself and to try to see yourself as you are seen 
and understand what what that is rather than what you think you are you know because as i as i sit here and and talk i think i'm i think of myself as quite svelte and so on but as i look at myself in the play i think i i look pretty tubby <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm looking at myself in the play saying, wow, I'm, I see myself as I am seen and, and that's shattering. <laughs> well, what's interesting to me too about the shattering part too, I mean, that's, that's a great image you're using there, you know, that distinction is different. But I remember in uh, brain spotting and at a point when the idea of a tornado, pre-tornado came to mind and it was interesting because if you've ever experienced a tornado right before it happens, the pressure drops immediately, yeah. Yeah. instantaneously. Nothing's holding you together. And the first time, you know, it's a little freaky, wiggy, you know, you, you start to almost lose it because you, you're on, in a sense, an immediate plateau. You have no true north and nothing's holding you together except you. The second or third time it happens, you have a little experience with it. And you go, oh, this is danger don't freak because panic is what kills you in those kind of situations and but i think the shattering piece there equates to that tornado pre-tornado experience when the pressure drops when your form your vessel shatters away how much form do you retain do you still just look like you and so i think there's the strength of that heart of the matter boundary where you know basically when hatching are you still just reformed or do you spill all over the place? So I, I kind of feel like, you know, Brian, you said, you know, well, Judaism is not a solo endeavor. And I think in that self-development piece, there is the solo endeavor of, you know, have I made at least some jello inside? So that if you take away my, my armature, so to speak, the sculptural armature supporting me until I'm ready and take the training wheels off the bike, will I still, be here like yeah. this or will i be just a lump of amoebic something something psychologically yeah. so there's a piece of boundaries but this the elect one shall sit those in you know sit on my throne well that's poignant so let's get through the next three lines here uh 680 yeah. paragraph 680 all shall become angels in heaven as azal and his hosts shall be cast into the burning fiery furnace for becoming subject to Satan and leading astray those who dwell on the earth. Um, and so this is an image of um, obviously of the universe being in balance, um, but it, it's also prescient about how the world may end. Um, Although, I guess I, uh, I mean, Robert Frost says that it'll end in fire and, um, and ice will suffice, <laughs> but ice will suffice. Uh, but well, I think footnote you know, 20 is really important there. We're here at last. We hear that the exodus of the 200 angels, here we go again, was a prank of Satan's. Right. Right. You know, so you, you get the, you know, always can return back, you know, the bad boy can always return back under mama's, you know, mama God's little arm and, you know, and be received and, oh, it's okay. He made another mistake, except God's unconscious, so he doesn't notice. I mean, he just, so Satan kind of runs out, makes a prank, and then hides back under the pleroma, so to speak. Um, right. And it, it brings to question, um, you know, we don't know how much longer life on earth will survive it, you know we do know that four and a half billion years from now there will be no earth that we know but we don't know whether human life or any kind of life on earth will survive beyond let's say a million years um and uh and then the earth might be a dead ball just floating around in space for for eternity um and and so it makes you wonder in the universe and as we see more and more of it with the with the um, 
James Webb Telescope and the Hubble, uh, it makes you, makes you wonder how many times Earth has or life has been spawned on other planets, and you know, appeared, lit up, and then went away. You you have to wonder that too and i also the you know going from the earth as the center of the universe to we understand we orbit the sun to if i look at the structural filter of the galaxy um you know how many days with the telescopes now how how often do we see oh that comet's passing a mile from the earth that comet's passing oh it's it's 100 million miles it doesn't matter but the fact how many times in the last hundred years has that happened gotten even closer we didn't even notice it except oh what was that going through the sky and it's gone like a cork as of, as it were sure and if you look at the function of jupiter <clears throat> and of saturn that are so many thousand times the size of the earth they're the they're the comet breakers because comets come in and invariably get struck and you know gobbled up into saturn's rings or uranus's rings or thrown off their own trajectory into the Kuiper belt. And so then they bang into something else and then the Kuiper belt pulls them along. So in a sense, there's a, you know, a planetary filter and just a solar system of the other planets that's required then for life on one of them, Earth, to not yeah, just occur, I mean, but then to continue. Yeah. yeah, the awesomeness of the universe is, is uh way beyond that though because uh, i just think of that image from the hubble that they took early on they wanted to <laughs> they wanted to point it at a, at a dark area in space and just see if they got anything if they exposed it yeah. for like 11 days and what they realized is they didn't get 1500 more stars they got 1500 more galaxies galaxies yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, stay, stand by for the James Webb telescope. Yeah, yeah right. it's coming up soon. Uh, they've, they've issued some preliminary photos. Okay, uh, uh, Brian, do you want to read uh, number the number 681? And we'll stop after that, except for the commentary. At the end of the world, the Son of Man shall, shall sit in judgment over all creatures. Quote, the darkness shall be destroyed and the light established forever, close quote. Even Yahweh, even Yahweh's two big exhibits, Leviathan and Behemoth, are forced to succumb. They are carved up and eaten. In this passage, Enoch is addressed by the revealing angel with the title Son of Man, a further indication that he, like Ezekiel, has been assimilated by the divine mystery is included in it as is already suggested by the bare fact that he witnesses it. Enoch is wafted away and takes his seat in heaven. In the heaven of heavens, he beholds the house of God built of crystal with streams of living fire about it and guarded by winged beings that never sleep. The head of days, comes forth with angelic quaternity, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Phanuel, and speak to him saying, this is the son of man who is born unto righteousness and righteousness abides over him and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes him not. So uh, let's hope that all of our listeners today are, are inspired to be righteous. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, I suppose you can be unrighteous and therefore uh, not con contribute to the consciousness of life. Um, but I guess you're contributing to it either way, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Um, well, this, you know, sidebar to that last paragraph, which is all about the, you know, the goodness and the light, which to me then, you know, the Hades part is just obviously missing. And so that just means, you know, Hades has gone back under the wing in a way. He's not pranking. So uh, there's these, you know, it will all be in light. 
okay, until Hades comes out with the next prank. And then no, not so much. You know, eternity never comes because until you always something have else this, breaks. <laughs> something else breaks. But I laugh that even, you know, Hades, the Lord of the Underworld, he has the Cerberus, right? His dog. Right. But but Cerberus comes from Kerberi, K-E-R-B-E-R-E, -E -E, which literally means spotted. So I think that it's funny that Hades, this trickster, literally named his dog Spot, mm -hmm. you know? So, and how, <laughs> how does that management of evil, you know, trickle down to where now how many people name their dog Spot? Well, do they know it comes from Kerberi or it's just a cool name for a dog? You know, and the reasoning, the etymology is lost over centuries. It's just, oh, that's a name for a dog, not Bill or Bob. Right. They, they, they think it's because of the markings on the dog and not. Yeah. Not for its psychological implications. Well, the, the, you know, the, the Cerberus would be, you know, jet black, except if you look at a panther, they're still spotted like a leopard. You know, it's just you have to get them in the right light to see that. Yeah. Almost the Mayan glyphs. I kind of wonder what oh. chicken on the egg. So I kind of <clears throat> thought a little bit. I, I know this is sort of well. I don't know. I, I, maybe Gnosticism is quite old um, because this is like at the Bronze Age, Iron Age interface that the Enoch was written. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it, to to me that <clears throat> you know the whole kind of Gnostic cosmology um, I, I thought has been given pretty good uh, I don't know uh, modern day clothing or contemporary day clothing in the Philip Pullman books which uh, is his dark materials which is the golden compass and then mm -hmm. the subtle knife and then the third one mm -hmm. um, and the thing is is in that shoal gives up the dead but that's the culmination. But then what happens is that when you leave Shoal, that you basically give back your sparks and you mm. disintegrate. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was just saying, like it's interesting that this, like these sorts of images, you know, I I think they're there and they get coalesced into different sort of cosmologies and yeah. You know, religions and texts and yeah, absolutely because even when the earth is destroyed by the sun it's it's material it's atoms will become part of the sun and it won't be the end of the universe it'll only be the end of this planet and you know even when the sun disappears and becomes part of a big bang or a he becomes part of a black hole again uh it may just lead to another big bang eventually and so or not or not or not yeah or exactly. this is first right and so we, we yeah, just dispersion versus the implosion and the implosion is required for the new to, right. to phoenix i mean and, and so the best we you know so the best we can do with consciousness is look at ourselves and yeah. s see that we understand the word righteousness and what that might mean for us and our society. Um, well, Brian, you bringing up the transition from the bronze to the iron age, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty, I mean, from a metallic standpoint, just metallurgy, I mean, bronze is brittle. It doesn't crack, it doesn't rot, but, but yeah, it's brittle. It's brittle, whereas iron is malleable until tempered, you know, into, you know, steel, et cetera. But it's interesting because from a consciousness, unconsciousness standpoint, I would say that bronze is more unconscious, more, it is just what it is. And it's in a sense more inert and untouchable by no rot, no rust. Yeah. Whereas iron is more alive and conscious because of rust and corrosion mm -hmm. and, the ability to roll it and heat it and and customize it as it were capital s self style in that gnostic way you mentioned you know back at the bronze to the iron so it's interesting i think just even from a metallurgy standpoint there's a an analogy to the psyche from you brought up from bronze to iron 
which I think interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because that's yeah, it's very interesting because you know that Tim often speaks right. with a certain amount of pride that that the bronzes that he make will will be just like they are five thousand years from now, yeah, as, as they are today. Um, when you, you pour them into molds, right, and, and, and then finish them, but and half them and all that, it, but yeah, the iron, you know, the whole beating to death and all the metallurgy that goes into that, um, yeah, you know, it's still, it's, hmm? the metaphor of nothing can destroy iron except iron itself. Hmm. You know, it rusts. Right. <laughs> Need a little rain there, so yeah. You're right, though, with the bronze, that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, because just, there's just, I think, quite a milestone in the moment, from unconscious Old Testament bronze, to conscious New Testament iron, and mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting, I have never thought about mining that little segue, but that's, that's, that's an interesting big. thought, yeah. It's even at the, so that there's the Iron Age is really like, I don't know, thousand, depending where you were in Europe, and the Levant. But by the time we're talking about the Levant and the Roman world, like the Iron Age is, is uh, culminated and we're now in classical antiquity. Yeah. So it's sort of like the iron has been discovered, worked through, figured out how to use, and then proliferated to a point of, you know, everyone, even if they don't have, you know, the... Right. The stuff themselves can they figure out a way to buy it or steal it or whatever. Right. And that, so now iron <clears throat> is the currency of violence. Right. right. And that and oh. that's that's the point of Tim's returning the nails uh, image too, right? Well, and what's the book? You know, guns, germs, and steel. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. it's the steel. You know, there's that comes from iron in that sense. It's steel is just iron that's been you know refined. Mm -hmm. Right, and a, and a nuclear reaction is just iron that's refined as well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, and then you take the grades of steel. I mean, take it from, you know, hardened steel, cast steel, forged steel, vanadium. You know, it's a whole, you get a whole, what can hold an edge, but also last. Yeah. Uh, mm. So, um Good stuff today. Huh? Good yeah, stuff today. Turned out okay. Um, we did get through, uh, what, from 76 to 681. So we got through five paragraphs this week. That's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs>